Good afternoon. This is Father Tim Friedrichsen coming to you live from my office and the St. Bernard Rectory with another Children's Bible Corner. Today I want to talk a little bit about the celebration that we're going to have tonight. I hope some of you tune in and watch that or you might be planning to um, join us for the 10 a.m. Mass tomorrow on Easter Sunday, or both. Why not? What else do we have to do, right? So anyway, tonight is what's called the Easter Vigil. And a vigil is a watching, a waiting. So what we're doing is watching and waiting for Easter. The other day when I talked to you about the Last Supper and how the Gospels report that that was a Passover meal that Jesus uh, celebrated with his disciples, I mentioned that that Passover was a meal to remember and to make present again, present again, the experience of being freed from the land of Egypt and being formed into God's people. And now we celebrate that Passover as a Christian Passover when our Lord Jesus, because of his life, death, and resurrection, frees us from sin and forms us into the people of God, to brothers and sisters in Christ, to children of God the Father, enlivened by the Holy Spirit. And we celebrate this vigil tonight during the night. So we wait until it starts, at least starts getting dark. So we celebrate it uh, starting tonight at 8 p.m. Now, why do we do that? Well, in Jesus' day, Jesus' people, the Jewish people, counted days from evening to the following evening. So when the sun goes down, that's when the day begins. And then it ends the next time the sun goes down. So from evening to evening, so to speak. Okay? So the Easter Vigil is a celebration that refers to uh, the time, sometime in the night, Jesus is raised from the dead, or rises from the dead. It's put both ways in the Bible. And I see I have a time, somebody asking the time for the Mass tonight is 8 p.m. So I'll remind me to ask you, or say that again, number of times. So anyway, so sometime between sundown on this night and sunrise, what we would call tomorrow morning, but they would say the morning of this day, Jesus rises from the dead. Transformed. A new resurrected life. And so we celebrate in the night. There are two times in the liturgical year where the church really asks that we celebrate in the night. The Easter Vigil and then also the Christmas Mass in the night. And traditionally that was always at midnight, and we had that this year here at, Bre at Breda. At the Passover meal, the youngest member of the family, because the whole family would be together, maybe some relatives too, however many people to eat the Passover lamb and, and all the food that was prepared. And uh, our Jewish brothers and sisters who are celebrating their Passover now uh, are like you and me, they have to do it virtually. So families are gathering using FaceTime or Facebook or Zoom or whatever works, right? So we're gathering with people virtually. So that changes things a little bit. But the youngest person of the family would always ask a question, a simple question. Why is this night different from any other night? And for the Jewish people, 
for Jesus when he was growing up, the answer to that was question answer to that question was because on this night God passed over our houses, spared us so that he might free us from slavery and bring us into the promised land. For you and me, why is this night different from any other night? Because on this night, we celebrate the night sometime between sun going down and some sun coming up. Jesus rises from the dead and wins a new victory that frees us even further, frees us from sin and from death. Ultimately, though we will physically die, we will live with him in resurrected life. So this night is so special. Tonight at the Easter Vigil, if you do watch, again, starting at 8 p.m. Um, oh, I see. I think Father Pick is helping me out here. He also uh, wrote Carol on a little note there, so that's good. I need all the help I can get. And he's a good, a good helper. My, or our parochial vicar, right? Our associate pastor. He, by the way, is going to be presiding tonight. I thought it was important. This is his first Easter vigil. Now, I should say, we could add here, why is this vigil different from every other vigil? Well, the answer to that is, of course, because we have to do it virtually. So Father Pick's first vigil is different from any vigil I've ever been at. And he's been working really hard, and today we, we worked a little bit together to figure out all the kinks, and hopefully it'll come off smoothly like all of our celebrations do. Yeah, right. Anyway, oh, he will be presiding. At this vigil mass in the night, we begin with a number of readings from Scripture. And uh, we are obligated to do three Old Testament readings, then a reading from Romans, and then a gospel reading. That's what we'll be doing tonight. And the first reading is the creation story in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, through chapter 2, verse 2b. No, 2a, excuse me. First half of the second verse in chapter 2. Now, I want to read that to you, children, and talk a little bit about it. Because... People who have studied cultures and stories and history and so forth pretty much agree that this story was originally intended for children, mostly. This was a story that parents and religious leaders would tell their people, and especially children, about the great love and order with which God created everything. Everything that is created, God created. And so we're going to walk through this a little bit. And I'm going to make some comments. I hope that works for you okay as we go through this story. So, a reading from the book of Genesis. The very beginning of the book of Genesis. And again, this will be the first reading tonight. So, you get to hear it twice. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was out form or shape, with darkness over the abyss, and a mighty wind sweeping over the waters. In the beginning. Nothing else had happened up until now, except God existing. He creates the heavens and the earth. Now, in Hebrew way of speaking, whenever they talk about the heavens and the earth, or right and the left, or good and evil, like opposites, good and evil, it's a way of including everything. So we could translate this, when God created the universe, or when God created all of creation. 
So it's their way of saying everything. And the heavens really mainly mean the sky, everything up there and the earth, so everything that down here. They had a very, they, they didn't know all about as much as we do about the universe and so forth at that time, because this is a very old story. This is before, before there were telescopes and before there were rocket ships and so forth. So we know so much more about the universe, about this amazing creation of God than they did. They talk about this formless mess. The Hebrew words are tohu wabohu. Isn't that cool? It just sounds messy, doesn't it? Tohu wabohu. You're going to learn some Hebrew in the course of this, by the way. So you can learn that. Tohu wabohu. Mom, Dad, my room is tohu wabohu. Well, then you better clean it up, right? Okay. I digress. Okay. So, and there's this mighty wind, this roar, this roar that's sweeping over it all. And that's kind of like when we read that, we can sort of think about roar. It's also the breath of God. Roar, Adonai, the breath of God. Uh, and so, ruach, this wind, can almost, almost seem like the Holy Spirit. They didn't know about the Holy Spirit yet. Jesus tells us about that. So we learned, have learned about the Holy Spirit. They didn't know about that yet. But there's sort of like a hint of that in this story. Then God said, Why Omer Adonai Yihior, Wa Yihior. Isn't that neat? And God said, Yihi or. Can you do that with me? Yihi or. Let there be light. Well, Yihi or. And there was light. Wow. Can you imagine? First time kids heard this? Somebody saying, And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. It's like, oh wow, what God said came to be. God then separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And here you go. Evening came, morning followed the first day. See? That goes back to what I was telling you earlier, that in the way Jewish people thought about days, it begins with the evening, the sundown, sun going down is the beginning of a new day. Okay, evening came, morning followed, the first day. Then God said, let there be a dome in the middle of the water, or, oh, I'm sorry, my eye jumped. Then God said, let there, oh no, that's right. I'm sorry, I mixed up here. Then God said, let there be a dome in the middle of the waters to separate one body of water from the other. God made a dome, God made the dome, and it separated the water below the dome from the water above the dome. And so it happened. God said it. He wants this dome. It's sort of like a big glass dome you can almost think of. There's going to be water up here. There's going to be water down here. Oops, down here. Okay. And it happened. There was a dome. God called the dome sky. Evening came. Morning followed. The second day. So now, in their way of thinking, the sky is sort of a dome, and there's waters up there, and then when it rains, sort of like little, little spigots or faucets open up, so to speak, or little holes will open up so that the water can come down. Again, these were ancient people; they didn't know about clouds and 
and humidity and all that stuff. Your mom and dad can explain that to you, right? You're doing homeschooling now, so you can maybe look that up, how that all works, how rain happens. Then God said, let the water under the sky be gathered into a single basin so that the dry land may appear. And so it happened. See? Once again, God says it, oh, and it happens. The water under the sky was gathered into its basin, and the dry land appeared. God called the dry land earth, and the basin of water he called sea. God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth bring forth vegetation, every kind of plant that bears seed and every kind of fruit tree on earth that bears fruit with its seed in it. And so it happened. The earth brought forth vegetation, every kind of plant that bears seed and every kind of fruit tree that bears fruit with its seed in it. God saw that it was good. Evening came, morning followed, the third day. Now notice, in these first three days, these are called the days of separation. So, I don't know if you've ever moved. I've had to move a number of times because it's going to school, a different school, and this parish, and that parish, and so forth. I don't always like moving. It's a lot of work. But one of the things you kind of do is you pack everything up and you put it all on a moving truck or whatever, in the back of a, some pickups or whatever, and it's sort of a tohu a bow. It's a mess. It's an abyss. It's this mess of stuff. And then the first thing you do as things start being brought into your new house, as they were done here, here at Brita, when Father Tim and I moved in, we had people helping us, wonderful people, family members. Uh, I had some former parishioners, uh, friends, uh, just so helpful. And uh, they did all the heavy lifting, I might add, because I was still there saying, okay, that goes to this room, that goes to this room, that goes to this room. I did, we did separation, right? The first thing, we have to put some order into this tohu wabohu. So if you go into your room and you're, you're supposed to clean your room, you know, sometimes you look at it as, oh, where do I begin? You begin by separating, dividing things out. Okay, these are the clothes. Maybe these are clean clothes and these are dirty clothes. These are toys. These are books. Whatever. So you start kind of deciding where what different things are and then where they go. And that's the first thing you do. And now on the third day, because God has the order done, light, darkness, sky, earth, well, waters above the sky, water, water below, dry land, earth, and the seas, ponds, and all of that rivers. Now he can start decorating. And he does that by first bringing forth all this vegetation on the earth, all the plants, and so forth. So this is a way for God to begin making this order beautiful. And sort of like when you move into a new place, and you're trying to decide, well, I got this, these pictures I want to hang, or maybe this artwork I want to hang, or these um, um, crosses or crucifixes or other religious items. I want to make our place look beautiful, make it homey, right? So after we get things all separated and moved in the right rooms, then we can start making a decision of where we put things, how we decorate. And that's what God is doing. 
Then God said, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate day from night. Let them mark the seasons, the days, and the years, and serve as lights in the dome of the sky to illuminate the earth. And so it happened. God said, let this happen, and it happened. Let there be light, yihi or, and there was light, yihi or. Now there are many lights. God made two great lights, the greater one to govern the day and the lesser one to govern the night and the stars. So the sun, the moon, and the stars. Up until now, it was just, I guess, a black dome. But now it's got light, beautiful lights. Sometimes that's something you do at a new place, too. It's like, oh, I'd like to put these, this light here, this lamp there, and so forth, you know, to make it all homey and make sure I can find my way through the house. God set them, let's see, where did we start? Or stop, excuse me. God set them in the dome of the sky to illuminate the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. God saw that it was good. Evening came, and morning followed the fourth day. Then God said, let the water teem with an abundance of living creatures, and on the earth let birds fly beneath the dome of the sky. God created the great sea monsters, and all kinds of crawling living creatures with which the water teems, and all kinds of winged birds. God saw that it was good, and God blessed them, saying, Be fertile, multiply, and fill the water of the seas, and let the birds multiply on the earth. Evening came, and morning followed the fifth day. Then God said, let the, let the earth bring forth every kind of living creature, tame animals, crawling things, every kind of wild animal. And so it happened. God made every kind of wild animal, every kind of tame animal, and every kind of thing that crawls on the ground. You see how repetitive this is? Remember to, it's easy to remember, you know. God said, let this happen, and then it says it, let it happen. Almost in the same words. It's almost like a poem, you know? Okay? So he made all the wild animals, all the tame animals, and all the things, the creepy crawlers, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make human beings in our image, after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, the tame animals, all the wild animals, and all the creatures that crawl on the earth. God created mankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them male and female, he created them. So humanity, human beings, mankind, humankind, male and female. God blessed them and God said to them, same thing he said to the fish and the other animals, be fertile and multiply. It's God saying, I want a lot of people. I want a lot of people to be my people. Be fertile and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and all the living things that crawl on the earth. God also said, see, I give you every seed bearing plant on all the earth and every tree that has seed bearing fruit on it to be your food. 
And to all the wild animals, all the birds of the air, and all the living creatures that crawl on earth, I give all the green plants for food. And so it happened. God looked at everything he had made and found it very good. Evening came, morning followed, the sixth day. So we had three days of separation, and on the third day we had two actions. Separation of the dry land and the watery uh, seas and so forth. And then the first act of decoration, all the plants and so forth. And so now we have three more days, three days of decoration, the fourth, fifth, and sixth. But on the sixth day, we have two actions again. God creates all the animals and creepy crawlers. And then God creates human beings, male and female. So it shows in this story, people were teaching their children, that God was making a hope for us. He was making all this creation for us. And because of that, we have a great responsibility. And unfortunately, many people have misunderstood this dominion. Some people think, well, that just means I can do whatever I want. Doesn't matter what I do to the creation. Well, that's not how God treats creation. He orders it. He makes it beautiful. He makes it a place where we human beings can live and be nourished by the food of the plants and the animals and the fish the birds. So God certainly takes great care of this creation. And that dominion comes from the word for king. And God is our king. And so his kingly way of creating is supposed to be our kingly way of taking care of it all. Very important. So we do things that take care of the earth. We don't litter. We don't do things that aren't good for the earth. We farm in ways that help our farmland to continue to produce forever, for years and years to come. We don't just take advantage of it. We take care of it. That's what good farming is, right? And we have a lot of good farmers in this area who do great care to make sure that the land produces a lot of food for animals and for humans, so that a lot of food is produced for many, many people in the world and so it can happen again next year, and the year after, and the year after, and the year after. We don't do it in ways that destroy things. We do it in ways that make it wonderful. There's a lot of things we do today that are hard on the earth. But we're getting better, I think. And you can see that around here. I'm so proud of Iowa. So proud of all the windmills we have. So proud of seeing people, uh, you know, being a little more mindful of taking care of the earth. And I think we're especially seeing that in this time. You know, when we saw pictures from big cities when they had to close down because of the coronavirus and when all the cars started, stopped driving all over and all the uh, factories had to close down for a bit, that was all sad. But what we saw, we saw the air clear up. For some people, 
in big cities. They saw the sky for the first time in a long time. And they saw that it was blue, the sky that God put there for us, that dome. Then he put lights in and made beautiful for us. And then threw up some birds there so they could fly around in it and whatnot. They all of a sudden, whoa! Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? So I hope one of the things that comes out of this time for all of us is that we all kind of say, you know what? There's some things we don't need to do. We don't need to drive as much as we do. We don't need to uh, burn as much as we do. We don't need to, whatever it might be. We all got to think about that, you know, pray about that. And then do things to care for this creation that God has given us. The great care he takes care takes to make it all we're supposed to use to take care of it all. That's called stewardship, that we're stewards. It's not ours, it's God's. It's not mine, it's God's. It's not just for me, it's for all of us. And then we also have to ask ourselves, is everybody getting what they need? And we know that's not true. We know there's poor people, hungry people, thirsty people. And sick people. And, you know, all that stuff. So again, our dominion is to try to help make sure everybody has what they need. Some people are going to have more because they maybe they are luckier. Uh, maybe they're born into a better situation than other people. That happens a lot. We're not all born in, we were, you know, I was born in a great situation. Most of us here in Iowa are born into wonderful situations. Good families, good land, good schools, good communities. You know, that's not true everywhere. We're so blessed. You're so blessed. And if we're blessed with much, as Jesus says in the Gospel of Luke, then Jesus wants us to use that. The one who is blessed much has much responsibility. And we've all been blessed by this beautiful creation that God has made. And so we have this responsibility, this dominion. Dominion doesn't mean rule like, uh, under my thumb. Dominion means, oh, this the king of the universe has entrusted to me and to all of us. So let us do the best we can to care for it, to make sure everybody enjoys its great benefits. It's wonderful things. Now we aren't finished. We have six days, but last I counted, and you know that too, there are seven days in a week. And this story is told, so it takes up a week. Number seven was very important in ancient cultures, in the Hebrew culture, in the Babylonian culture, in, in uh, uh, Persian culture. All seven was the, the word seven in a lot of those languages has the meaning of being filled, fulfilled, complete, satiated. Satiated means I've had enough good food and drink that I feel really satisfied. That'd be a better word. That's probably one you know. Being satisfied. Seven is related in many languages to those words. Thus, the heavens and the earth and all their array were completed. Sort of all the thingness of creation was completed. On the seventh day, God completed the work he had been doing. The seventh day, he completed the work he had been doing. How does he complete the work he has been doing? God rested on the seventh day from all the work he had undertaken. That's how he completes it. Your work and my work aren't complete unless we take 
a rest. Especially the day of rest, which in Jesus' day was what we call the Sabbath, what we would call Saturday. From Friday, but for them it'd be Friday evening to Saturday evening. For us, for Christians, it is now what sometimes in the Bible is called the first day of the week, Sunday, because that's the day on which Jesus rose from the dead. And in early Christian thinking, they would say, and God even more fully completed creation on the eighth day, the day of the resurrection of our Lord, which is kind of true. It's really a wonderful way of thinking about it. And so Jesus rests this day in a very serious way, because he has died on the cross. He rests so that he can rise to new life and bring a new creation on the eighth day, on Sunday. So we should rest too. It's a very important. And that's another thing that I think we're going to learn from this pandemic. There are many people who are working very, very hard in all sorts of ways. And, and God love them, you know, uh, to make sure we have what we need, and especially people who are working to care, take care of the sick and people who are suffering and so forth. Oh, they're working hard. They're working hard. But I hope that all of us, as we come through this, whether we're working really hard or having extra time to rest, that we remember God wants us to rest. And we modern human beings are not real good at that. Anyway, God rested on the seventh day from all the work he had undertaken. God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Come back to that in a second. Because on it, he rested from all the work he had done in creation. There's two words I want to talk about before I close up this little lesson, okay? First is good. God saw that it was good. You hear that, right? A number of times. And then at the end, when all this stuff is created and human beings are created, God saw that it was very good. In the New Testament, when a scribe comes up to Jesus and says, Good teacher, Jesus says to him, Why do you call me good? God alone is good. Now, had he known Jesus was the Son of God, you know, God the, the Son, he could have said that, you know, well, I'll call you good because you're God the Son, but he didn't know that, okay? But another thing he could have said, I call you good teacher because, I call you good, because as a teacher, your teachings reflect God, who is good. Every time God says he saw that it was good, the story is telling you and me that creation reflects God. And the better we understand creation, the whole universe, the better we understand God. It's not always easy to figure that out, but that's why in the Catholic Church we've always had great scientists and great uh, thinkers and great artists and everything, because everything that is good and beautiful reflects God and helps us to know God better. So whenever you're learning, you know, in some ways, all of that learning helps us to realize, wow, isn't God fantastic? He is awesome. I mean, you can't even think of it. It's just way over the top how wonderful God is. And then God rests and makes that day holy. 
We could say similarly, only God is holy. But we are holy because God has made us good. In our nature, we reflect God because we are made in his image and likeness. So we are good. And to be holy means that in addition to being good, we're set apart for a purpose, for a mission. In this story, one of the main things is we're set apart to be the stewards, the one creature, we're creatures, just like, in some ways, like the other animals and so forth, but we're the creature that has the greatest responsibility because God has given us so much, his image and likeness, ways of thinking that are advanced. We don't always use it as much as we could, but he has set us apart for the purpose of being good stewards, of having that dominion over all that he's created, caring for it, making sure all people benefit from all the goods of creation. And in this case, he set apart that day of rest that we are called to set apart to. Now we'll probably still have to get up, like I grew up on a dairy farm, you had to milk the cows. But the rest of the day, on Sunday, usually, not always, the rest of the day was we went to mass together, we had a family dinner together, maybe played some ball in the backyard. We didn't do all the other work that we did during the week. Now, sometimes that was different because, especially planting and harvesting. But I remember when I was a child, when I was little, I remember our pastor, Father Oaken, my great hero. He would say, well, you know, it's been a little bit wet this week. Didn't have much of a chance to get out of the field. So I give you permission or I dispense you from the obligation of resting today. Sort of saying, well, you had some rest early in the week. So today, since we have to get the crop in, you can go do it. But the priest gave us the permission. Yeah, nobody asked me about that anymore. <laughs> Which I'm fine with, by the way, because I'm not, I don't want to be responsible for other people's choices. It's hard enough to be responsible for my own choices. So my my purpose is to help people make good choices, just as all of us do, to a certain degree. Parents help us make good choices. Teachers help us make good choices. Uh, law enforcement people help us make good choices. But we're set aside. We're set apart. for this great role of caring for creation. And the seventh day, or in our case, the eighth day, the day of the Lord's resurrection, is set apart and made holy so that we might rest and be rejuvenated and recreated in God. It's a wonderful story. Lots going on in it. It's very repetitive, but it's easy to remember that way. And it was meant to be easy to remember. Because back when that was first written, they didn't really have many books. They had what were called scrolls, but most people didn't have them. So they learned stories by heart. We're so lucky today that we have books. So if I, oh, I don't quite remember how that went. We didn't look it up and reread it. But in those days, they were better at remembering than we are, I think. Must have been. Otherwise, we would have so many books from them, right? All right. So children, that's the first reading tonight at Easter Vigil, which will start at 8 p.m. tonight. If you tune in. Tomorrow, my plan, we'll put that in quotes, but my plan is to have another children's 
Bible Corner on the Gospel Passage for Easter Sunday. Okay? I'm sure that'll work out. I think it will. We're talking snow tomorrow. Yeah, don't like that much. But God bless you all. I hope you have a happy Easter. It'll be a different Easter, but we can do it in special ways and we'll remember it for a long, long time. But what's most important is that we remember that we celebrate the Lord's resurrection, which is our hope and the promise of life eternal in God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So may God bless you and your family, may the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Miss you so much. And Father Tim and I love you so much. Because we're all God's children. Take care.